I got my blood test results back. And I'm going to share them with you. We're going to go through my lipid panel. We're going to go through my metabolic panel. We're going to go through some of my hormone panel, some of my testosterone levels, things like that. And I'm doing this because I want to be able to share it with you. Full transparency, and you know what I eat. I follow a largely Mediterranean-style ketogenic diet, and I practice intermittent fasting. So what do my numbers look like? Well, let's have a peek. Of course, I've blocked out the data because I don't want you knowing exactly where I live and things like that, but I'm going to be able to show you everything here, 100% what is on my lab test. To make sure you hit that red subscribe button, and then please do hit that bell icon so you never, ever, ever miss a beat on this channel. And then after this video, check out Thrive Market down below in the description. Online membership-based grocery store, super awesome for keto foods, for fasting-related products, things like that. Check them out down below. It gets delivered right to your doorstep, and a lot of times ends up being lesser priced than you would find at the grocery store. So check them out after this video. So we'll dive right in. I'm gonna try to explain some of this stuff, but I'm gonna keep it simple so we don't spend a half an hour going over this. The big one that people always ask is they always say and almost quote, I'd love to see what your cholesterol looks like with all that saturated fat and with all the fat that you consume on keto. Well, first of all, I consume largely a Mediterranean style ketogenic diet. So I eat a lot of olive oil. I consume a lot of macadamia nut oil. I consume a lot of avocado and avocado oil which has some pretty powerful effects on lipid panels. Anyway, uh, you can look on the screen, but I'm gonna show you right here. Right here on my lipid panel, my total cholesterol is 185. Now this is after a 12 hour fast, okay? Um, granted, I practice fasting normally, but anyhow, 185 total cholesterol, the reference range is anything under 200 is considered good. Well, let's break it down a little bit more. My HDL cholesterol was 74. My HDL or my good cholesterol, my high density lipoprotein, that is the cholesterol that gets brought back to the liver or the carriers that brings uh, fats to the liver, right? Pretty decent. I would have liked to see it a little higher if I was getting super granular. I like that number closer to 100 personally. I love super high HDL. My triglycerides, 63. Anything under 150 milligrams per deciliter is considered healthy range. 63. So people typically will say if you're following a ketogenic diet, your triglycerides are going to go through the roof because that's the mobilized form of fat. Well, if your body knows how to use those fats, they don't stay in your bloodstream. My body is taking those mobilized fats and utilizing them, so my triglycerides sat at 63. But then my LDL cholesterol, 96. Okay, anything under 100 is considered healthy and within range. So yes, it's on the higher end. But what I didn't do is a fractionated panel. So I didn't look into uh, my small particle, my fluffy particle, large particle, etc., cetera, uh, because I wanted to see where I was at first. I'm not out of range, so I don't need to investigate it further. It's not uncommon to see your LDL cholesterol up a little bit more because what's happening is they are carriers that are carrying lipids, and LDL cholesterols carry lipids to sources. So because my body is fat adapted, it's not uncommon to see that. So I'm perfectly happy with that where it is. That's a perfect thing. And then we have what's called the cholesterol HDLC ratio, which is just a ratio of my basically total cholesterol with HDL cholesterol. Uh, Non-HDL, none of that really matters here right now because that's still within the perfectly respective range. So I wanted to cover that because my lipid panel, by most standards, is very, very good. I could have a little bit more HDL. I like to see it again closer to 100, but keto clearly isn't affecting me negatively there. Then we get down to something interesting here. My glucose is actually pretty high, my fasting glucose. Well, what is going on here? Well, there's two things. For one, I was in a fasted state. And if you are a largely fat adapted person that does a lot of fasting, it's not uncommon for your glucose levels to be a little bit elevated in a fasted state because of what is called peripheral insulin resistance. What that means is that my body is so accustomed to using fats as a fuel source that it ends up actually being somewhat insulin resistant to the glucose and shuttles it to the brain. The other piece of the equation is I worked out this morning. Okay, so that's going to elevate my glucose levels. That's absolutely acceptable and happens all the time because when you work out, your glucose levels are a little bit higher. Now, another thing that I'm gonna go ahead and disclose health information about myself in the spirit of transparency, I was 100 pounds overweight before and I was pre-diabetic. That's hard to get rid of. I always have a tendency to be on the higher glucose scale because I'm pre-diabetic, even though I keep it controlled because of my diet, because of my lifestyle. That's a damage that I did to my body that I have to work hard to overcome. And that's part of life and part of me being transparent here. So now let's get into the metabolic panel. I don't need to spend a ton of time here to be completely uh, frank with you because 
everything is right in range, but there's something that I want to show you. If you look at my whole metabolic panel, like my urea nitrogen, my creatinine, everything like that, my urea nitrogen is 17 on a scale of 7 to 25 being normal. What that means is that's the amount of protein uh, basically that I have circulating that I am going to excrete, okay? Urea nitrogen, nitrogen balance. That means that I'm in a good state. I'm in a nice neutral state. I'm not breaking down muscle and I'm not having too much. So what that means is even though I am someone that fasts frequently, I am not breaking down muscle. I'm sparing it, which just further justifies some of the things I talk about, but probably explains why I maintain muscle even when I fast because I'm staying at this state. So we can kind of rip through here, but a lot of these things are just your overall uh, components of your metabolic panel. If you see any weird red, red flags on there, they would be in bold. Uh, I like that my uric acid is very low, which indicates that even though I consume quite a bit of meat, uh, I don't seem to have any kind of instances of gout or uric acid issues coming to be. I consume a fair bit. I consume between 200 and 300 grams of protein a day and no increase in uric acid there. Okay, moving on down the line. This is some of the stuff that I know people are gonna wanna see. My T3 levels. Okay, a lot of people say that if you do keto or you fast, your T3 levels are going to be low, your thyroid levels. And that's not uncommon for people. But I've been doing keto for nine or 10 years and my free T3, available thyroid hormone, is right smack dab in the middle of where it should be, a 3.3, okay? So reference range 2.3 to 4.2, right where I need to be. My T3 or reverse T3, again, right smack in the middle. Reverse T3 is, it's arguable whether it really matters, okay? When T4 is converted into T3, it's also partially converted into reverse T3, which plays a role in the further uptake and the further conversion. Either way, my reverse T3 is right smack where it needs to be. Now IGF. There's going to be people out there. This video is not created to counter haters or anything like that, but there's plenty of people out there that think that um, growth hormone is at play here. Well, my IGF levels are right smack dab in the middle. Once again, 53 to 331 nanograms per milliliter is the standard IGF levels. I'm sitting right at 220, okay? That means that even though I'm fasting, which is supposed to break down your IGF a little bit, bring it down, I'm still sitting at a nice neutral level. My body has found nice homeostasis there. And then you have what is called the Z-score. And for any of you statistical analysis peeps out there, you know that that's basically kind of like the difference from the mean, right? Mathematical statistics, annoying stuff. Um, I'm at a 1.0, which actually tilts me slightly towards, because this takes into the consideration that I'm a male and my age and everything like that. This says I'm slightly skewed higher than most people my age, which is exactly where I want to be. Naturally higher levels than most of my peers, okay, but it's at a good level that is indicating that I'm perfectly natural and in a good state there. All right, now let's get into the complete blood count. Okay, this is where things get kind of fun. We're not gonna go into a lot of this, like the neutrophils and stuff like that, because they're all within range, but I can still touch on them. So white blood cell count, 7.5. I'm right smack dab in the middle, means I probably don't have an infection going on or any serious trauma. Here's where it's kind of fun. People don't like to do cardio. They don't like to do endurance work. Well, it shows in their blood work usually. My red blood cell count is 5.8. The range, 4.2 to 5.8. I am at the very high end of that range, almost out of it. Red blood cells are what deliver oxygen. I do a lot of cardio. I like to run, I like my endurance work, I like my high intensity interval work, and it shows in my blood work, my oxygen carrying capacity. This demonstrates that I am a healthy athletic person, and I'm not saying that to toot my horn, I'm saying it that I'm not someone that just eats a healthy lifestyle and, and doesn't really work out. This shows that you do need to apply yourself and work out. And then my hemoglobin is sort of the capacity of that. Okay, what actually is delivering it and actually holding it, how much oxygen it can hold. So my hemoglobin is 16.1 and the range is 13.2 to 17.1. So sitting really high on that too. Meaning I can deliver oxygen to cells very, very effectively. These, now you usually will see numbers higher if people are doing serious altitude training, but some of these numbers are what people do go to altitude to train for, to achieve these kinds of numbers so that they can perform better. Uh, hematocrit, right in range there, a tad on the high side. The only way you can really lower your hematocrit is to go donate blood, really. That's really the only way. Um, but it's not dangerously high, so I'm not worried about it. Platelets, all that stuff is good. Then we get to one thing that's out of whack. And it's not far out of whack, 
but it is enough, enough out of whack for me to look at it. My iron levels are a little bit low, which is not uncommon, but it makes you wonder, is Thomas anemic or what's going on? Well, you have a lot of different factors. You have your total iron, but then you also have what is your total iron binding capacity, right? Your TIBC. And that can change depending on the person. So this number is not enough to give you a diagnosis of any kind of issue. But it's also not uncommon to see iron levels dropping if you are overtraining a little bit, if you're working out a little bit too much, because they usually end up dropping as a result of some tissue damage that can occur from working out. That would be my guess on that. I was probably pretty run down because I tend to run myself down because if you're like me, then it doesn't need an explanation. I don't have any other way to live other than just going to redline all the time. Uh, none of these really matter because the, the levels are there. Glucose 6-phosphate uh, dehydrogenase, that's usually, that would be elevated if you had kind of a, um, a mutation. Here's a number that a lot of people are going to want to see. My testosterone levels, 417. The scale is 250 to 827 nanograms per deciliter. I am in the middle on the low side. I've always sat with relatively low testosterone and I've always done videos that talk about how testosterone is not the end of the world. But my levels are pretty much still within healthy range. They're just on the lower side. So I know there's people out there that are wondering the whole natty or not thing and I never go into that situation because quite honestly that's a petty argument that you never win or, or lose because it's just going to always exist. But where we stand right here right now, that is what my testosterone levels are. They're not very high and they're not too low. So it is what it is. Uh, my PSA, which is going to be related to my prostate, right smack in line. I'm in my 30s, so I don't expect to have a prostate issue just yet, uh, but you should always look at that number. Remember, I'm not a doctor. This is just my stuff. Okay, this one's kind of interesting because this looks at sex hormone binding globulin, which is what binds to your testosterone. So that total testosterone number is what matters if you're looking at just the aggregate. You want to look at your free or available testosterone, right? That's the actual testosterone that has an effect. Well, we didn't look at that. We looked at the sex hormone binding globulin instead because that gives us a more dynamic figure, at least as far as I'm concerned. I want to see how much binding globulin I have. So basically, you have your total testosterone and this SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin, binds to that testosterone and yields it to be either useless because it's bound to it and whatever you're left over is what you can actually use. I'm at a 39 with a healthy scale between 10 and 50. So I'm on the high side of sex hormone binding globulin, which means of the testosterone that I have available, uh, or of the testosterone that I have in the bloodstream, not a whole lot of it's available, but not enough to really raise a red flag. Meaning, I'm really sitting on the low end of testosterone. So don't tell my wife, but apparently I have a little bit of low T, and I'm not doing anything to correct it because I don't feel like I need it. I feel good, I feel strong, my libido is good. Who really cares? Then we get into vitamin D, and I'm going to end on this because it's pretty important. Vitamin D is a good indicator of your overall just metabolic health, if you ask me. So many people are deficient in it, and it is a hormone. Vitamin D is not just a vitamin. It's a hormone that dictates so many things and is related to your ability to utilize fat, your ability to utilize visceral fat and get rid of visceral fat. Very powerful and very important for your overall hormone function in general. I am right smack in the middle, actually more so on the high side, uh, 49 with a range of 18 to 72. Then we look at my actual vitamin D3, I'm still sitting at uh, 49. And then we look at vitamin D2 uh, and I'm a little bit on the low side, a little bit on the low of vitamin D2. Well, vitamin D2 can convert into vitamin D3, but vitamin D2 is the direct vitamin D you're getting generally from plant sources. So mushrooms, some olives, things like that. They do convert eventually into D3 through a complicated pathway, but that's not a, that's not a number that I really care about because vitamin D2 just shows me that, dang it, Thomas didn't eat a bunch of mushrooms the last three days. The vitamin D3 is my actual serum levels that I wanna pay attention to and is more appropriate for how much sunlight I get, how much good fatty fish I eat, how much oysters and sardines, the things that you all make fun of me for eating, and how much of those I get. But that just gives you a basic guideline. 
I'm not even supplementing with vitamin D right now because it's summertime and I don't feel the need to and I base it on my blood work and how I feel. Anyhow, I could do more in-depth stuff and if you want me to go into detail on a fractionated LDL panel, heck, why not? I'm an open book. I just showed you that I'm pre-diabetic based on this paperwork, right? Although I have a response as to why and I just gave you some of my medical history. I don't care, I'll share it with you because it's how we all get better. It's how I get better, it's how you get better. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.